Type. Today, we're continuing our series, My Type. And uh, during this series, you're going to discover how your unique personality type affects your relationships, your career, and your spiritual life. And it's based on the Myers-Briggs concept. About 2 million people a year take the Myers-Briggs. They have been for 50 years. It's a famous uh, personality type inventory. And when you take the Myers-Briggs personality inventory, you'll be scored as four letters. There are four main types of personalities, and then four within each of those four main types for a total of 16. And you'll be scored as four letters. And we talked about these more last week, so if you missed it, you could go back and watch that sermon. But your letters will either be an I or an E. You're an introvert or an extrovert. That just means where do you get your energy? Introverts get their energy from being alone. You just need to recharge your batteries. Extroverts get energy from being around other people. Sensory or intuitive. Sensory people see concrete details, colors, numbers, the, just the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. And just whatever is in front of them, they see that and they see it well. Intuitive people are interested more in ideas, meaning, theories, uh, concepts, thinking and feeling. This is how we make decisions. When you have a decision to make, do you first go to logic and what's, what's logically consistent? If so, you're a thinker. Or do you first go to, well, who are the people involved? What are the heart issues involved? If so, you're a feeler. And then J and P, judging and perceiving. Judging has nothing to do with the negative concepts we have of the word judging. Like, who are you to judge me? It has nothing to do with that. Judging means I like structure. I like to be scheduled. I like deadlines. I like to hit those deadlines and, and hit them on time. Perceiving means I'm the kind of person who I'm, I'm always open. More, it's more open-ended, more spontaneous, more unstructured, J or P. So what are your four letters? Do you know them? If you don't, I see somebody nodding. Thank you for knowing your four letters. If you don't, there's a, a link in your worship folder, and you could go online for free and take one of these personality inventories and find out what they are. And uh, again, this is just an overview there are also, in your worship handout, uh, there are links to three websites you could go to and find out more about your unique personality makeup. We won't be able to get all the details today. You could, you could learn things, literally, that'll change your life if you'll take the time to go to those websites and, and, and read about your personality. So here are the four types, and when we're talking about them, last week we talked about rationals. Today we're talking about idealists, people who have, have an N and an F in their four-letter code. Then Men's Day next week, we're talking about guardians, and then the 22nd, we'll wrap it up with artisans. To follow Jesus, and that's what we're here to do. We, we want to learn how to follow Jesus. We want to gather together, worship God. We believe that God meets us here where we are as we sing, as we interact with each other, whether it's the foyer, whether it's in here. We believe that God is somehow present here, and we connect with God here, and then we want to follow Jesus throughout the week entire lives. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. And if you were to say, Jesus, what does it mean to follow you? Here is the answer Jesus would give. It's very plain in the Gospels. Jesus would say something like this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In other words, everything you are with your whole being, you love God. It's love. And then verse 31, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. That's an important line, actually. There is no commandment greater than these, Mark 12. If you are loving God with your whole being and you are loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself, you are doing everything God requires of you. Doesn't that feel kind of good? Kind of refreshing? I'm not saying it's easy. Let me know when you get this down, right? It's, it's a lifelong process, and that's why growth and transformation is important. That's where this series comes into play. We want to discover, who, who am I? How am I made up uniquely? Because we, we all do actually process information differently from each other. How do, how do I grow? How do I connect with God? How do I process what I read in the Bible? How do I interact with other people in my life that Jesus wants me to love? We all do that differently based on our personality. And then I want to grow in that. And as we said last week, Paul put it like this in Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, grow, change. Let God change you. Let God move you. Let God work in your life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, 
and perfect will. If we find out who we are, my, my, my own unique personality makeup, and then I, I invite God to work in my life and through my life as I am u- uniquely made, then I can be transformed and grow towards loving God and loving my neighbor as myself. That's, that's why we're here, and we believe that knowing about ourselves can help us to do that. Now, here's an overview of idealists. Idealists make up about 15 to 20 percent of the population. So some of you here are idealists in the Myers-Briggs concept. If you're not an idealist, you might be married to one. I know you're friends with one, and I know for, for sure that you have idealists in your church family. And so even if you're not an idealist, it's a great advantage to you to learn what makes idealists tick and how to relate with Idealists. Idealists are people who function primarily by intuitive feeling. They're NFs. Intuition means, again, they see the big picture, uh, concepts, meaning. What what does it mean? Not so much the details, but what does it mean? And then by feeling, uh, NFs, idealists make decisions first by looking at who are the people involved? What are the heart issues involved? How does this affect relationships? What does this mean for the social fabric? They're intuitive feelers. Uh, here are the four types of idealists, and this is one of the, one of the areas you could go to these websites in your, uh, your worship folder and learn more about if this is your type. The ENFJ teacher, these are David Kiersey's words, the INFJ counselor, the ENFP champion. What a great name. We're going to be a champion. How cool is that? INFP healer. What a great word, healer. So you could, you could go to one of those websites and then just look up your personality, your, your letters, and find out about your unique personality. So characteristics of idealists, we'll run through these. First of all, idealists are altruistic. Idealists want to do good things in the world. Idealists are other people centered. I mean, this is great. Most people love idealists. They wanna make the world better. They care about people. Idealists are empathetic. To be empathetic, we talked about a few weeks ago, means that I'm willing to enter into the pain of other people, into their experience. I'm, I'm, I'm able and willing to put myself in somebody else's shoes and look at life from their perspective. What an amazing quality. Idealists are empathetic. Idealists value authenticity. Last week we talked about rationals and we said that rationals value achievement. And one of the areas of self-doubt for a rational is, have I achieved enough? Rationals all, all, might always feel like they're on the brink of failure, wondering if they've achieved enough. Idealists ask, uh, ask a different question. They ask, am I authentic enough? Am I living up to my values? That's the major area of self-doubt. If you're an idealist, I hope this speaks to you. Do you, do you question yourself? Do you sometimes feel like you're not good enough or, or uh, something's wrong with you because you're not, you have this ideal in mind of who you want to be and what it means to be a good person and how you want to live and you just wonder if you live up to that or not? Am I reading anybody's email? Is that, does that ring true for anybody? Idealists, what a great question. Am I authentic enough? Do I live up to my values enough? Idealists are enthusiastic. They're, they're, yeah, that's right. They're, they're passionate people. I love it. They, they, have a, they have a fire. These are people who live for the, from the heart, and they believe that things matter in life, and they're committed to those, and, and they're enthusiastic, and it's contagious. It's awesome. I, uh, idealists are romantic and this isn't just in, in romantic relationships, it's in all areas of life. To be romantic is to have the ideal in mind. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but idealist and romantic, they're very similar words. Idealists are also mystical. Idealists, of course, this is a general, uh, generalization, but can be naturally spiritual. Kiersey actually calls idealists uh, the most spiritual of the types. The people who just automatically sense a connection with something bigger. Idealists seek wisdom. They aspire to be people of wisdom. Wisdom means to live life well, not just to have knowledge, but to be able to apply it to life and to live well. And then as leaders, idealists are catalysts. Idealists jumpstart things. They bring energy, enthusiasm to a project. They, 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 They motivate people, inspire people to do something that needs to be done. They believe in a cause. I see this, there's this problem and that is not okay with me. It's not okay with God, and it's not okay with me. And, and idealists will feel passion about that, and their passion's contagious. So what, a, uh, what an amazing set of qualities, characteristics of idealists. So let's talk about the rest of the message. I wanted to kind of fly through this information, and then the rest of the message, we're going to talk about what this means for relationships, career, and spiritual life. So first, relationships. 
if you're in a relationship with an idealist, the number one thing you need to know is that idealists search for a soulmate. Someone who they can have a heart-to-heart, deep, emotional connection with. And this might be a connection that they, they can't even quite put into words. And if they could put it into words, it would just be poetry. The, the language of poetry would be the only language adequate to describe this deep heart-to-heart connection that idealists long for in a relationship. Again, if you remember last week, rationals look for a mind mate, somebody they can have intellectual conversations with. Idealists look for a soulmate, somebody they can, they can connect with heart-to-heart. Now, listen to this quote from David Kiersey. It's from a book called Please Understand Me about idealist relationships. And we want to look at the strengths of each personality. And we also want to offer some guidance in what could be pitfalls so that we can be transformed and grow. Kiersey writes, in all areas of life, idealists are concerned not so much with practical realities as with meaningful possibilities with romantic ideals. If their love life lacks this romance, idealists have been known to romanticize their relationships, infusing them with a glow of perfection that can rarely be sustained in the harsher light of reality. All too often, the NF falls into the pattern of romantic projection accompanied by considerable investment of effort and emotion, ending in painful disillusionment. This kind of sobering reality check confronts idealists sooner or later in all of their romantic relationships and how they deal with it. Whether they choose to develop what they have or move on to other dreams determines to a great extent the course of their personal lives. And the good news is idealists are the best suited of all the types to develop what they have. When when we are disappointed, not to jump from relationship to relationship, but to give it all we've got and not give up easily. I know an idealist man, we'll see how this quote plays out, an idealist man who struggled in his marriage because his wife was not nearly as emotionally open as he is, which is kind of against the stereotype, right? Stereotypes are not always true. That's just important to keep in mind. He, he was frustrated because his wife was not as emotionally open as he was, and they didn't have that soulmate connection that he was looking for. Idealists in relationships at times, if, if that connection is not there, idealists can feel alone in a crowd. Idealists can feel alone in a marriage. They can have this ideal for their marriage and, and, and this, this desire for this deep connection but the other person just isn't quite there, chances are they didn't marry an idealist. And that's just the conundrum for all relationships, right? Opposites attract. We think problems would go away if the person was a lot more like us. That's just not true. We, we marry different people for a reason. And, and the, the person's probably not an idealist, and they don't, they don't even sense that same desire. So they may not even know that the idealist doesn't feel the connection they want to feel. And so it's extremely important for an idealist to communicate lovingly, openly, vulnerably, not, not by attacking and blaming, not waiting until they're so mad they just explode, but when, when they start to feel, you know, I just wish that we had a deeper emotional connection than we have. I just wish that there are times we could talk about things and just kind of share from the heart. And an idealist, of course, you don't have to verify this, but let me just see if this is right for those of you who are idealists. Sometimes you look for that heart-to-heart connection with the person you're with, and you just feel like there's this distance. You're just not as close as you want to be to that person. And that can build up inside of you, and you don't want to, you don't want to say it because idealists don't like conflict. You don't, want to, you don't want to create a problem by saying that out loud, but it's still there, and so it builds and builds and builds over time, and then an idealist can kind of, kind of snap and say it all, all at once in a, in a very emotional way and then drive the person farther away. So my friend... Uh, talked to his wife, and they went to marriage counseling together. And they, they had to learn how to communicate all over again. They'd been married for quite a while. But there was this connection that was missing, and they had to learn to communicate in a way that would work for both of them. And God bless her, the wife did it. She did it. And, and they, they have, it's, again, it's not the ideal that my friend imagines. And, and he would probably be the first person to tell you, that's never going to happen with anybody. My, my, my standards of perfection were just impossible. They're just too high. 
So I've, I've moderated those a little bit, but we have a much better relationship than we used to have. Idealists can feel alone. They can feel discouraged and disillusioned in a relationship. So if you feel that way, if you're an idealist and you feel like, oh, there's this distance in my relationship, don't let it build and build and build over time. It's, it's not so bad. If, you know, I know conflict can be difficult, but it's not so bad that you say, you know, this is how I feel. I'm just being, I love you. And I just want you to know, because I love you, this is how I feel. And I want to work on it. And you certainly hope that your partner will, will love you enough to respond and want to meet your needs. A couple other things. Uh, by boundaries and expression, guarding against delusionment. One of the struggles that idealists can have in relationships is one of boundaries. And, and one of the ways that can work is by loving people so much and entering into other people's lives so much that idealists can be deceived and taken advantage of. A lot of times idealists are such good-hearted people. They'll enter into some situation, somebody's a problem, and they'll get involved in it, they'll roll up their sleeves, man, they'll be right there with them, and they find out they've been, they've been used, they've been had. And so to guard against deception, it's important for an idealist to always use discernment. And maybe even ask some other people, you know, I see this person who needs help, or maybe it's a person you're just starting to date, right? And, and you, want, you want somebody else's input. To just, to, just to help give you a different perspective because your heart just goes out to this person and you want to connect and, and idealists are just such great people and they want, to, they want to connect and get involved and help. You might just want to ask for some other input to be discerning. One more thing before we move on. Outside of romantic relationships, one of the struggles in relationships that idealists have is idealists typically want to please everyone. They want to make everybody happy. And, and of all the, the personality types, idealists probably struggle the most with being people pleasers. And these are, these are things, these struggles come out of qualities that lots of us wish we had. A lot of us wish we had as much love in our hearts as, as idealists do and want to get involved in people's lives and help as much as idealists do. We're just talking about, you know, every strength is a weakness. So we're just talking about some of those weaknesses and how we can be stronger in those areas. And so idealists have to be reminded, perhaps, that we can't please everyone. How many of you would say amen to that? Amen, brother. We can't please everyone. From my own world of pastoral ministry, I, I heard a friend, you know, who, kind of a mentor, tell me this, and then I read it somewhere else, so I believe it. Two, two sources, I believe it. You know. um, I read it on the internet, so it, it must be true. Um, it's been true in my experience, I can tell you that. In the pastoral world, here's what they tell pastors going into a church. Just know this. You're going to be a pastor, which implies that you're a leader, and uh, you should just know this going in. 10% of the people in the congregation are not going to like you just because they don't. Like, that's it. There, there's, there's no other reason. Maybe it's a personality conflict. They, they just don't like your personality. Maybe you remind them of somebody they didn't like before. <laughs> just maybe, I don't know, like you have the same mannerisms or something. And, and they, just don't, they just don't like you. And they're not going to. And so that's 10% right there. So if you're just trying to please everybody, there's 90% that you can please, but there's 10% you can't please. And then at any given time, about another 10% of the congregation will be angry at you about something. Maybe you just, you didn't reply to an email soon enough. You didn't say yes to somebody's idea and, and they're not going to like you. So there's 80% right there. The best pastors have an 80% approval rating, which means not everybody likes you. You can't please everybody. That's the best pastors. The average pastor it's a lot lower than that. I shudder to think what mine might be. We won't take a poll right now. But that's a, that's a great pastor, has an 80% approval rating. If you're the president of the United States and you have a 51% approval rating, you can get reelected. If you have a 60% rating, you're like, you're golden. If there were no term limits, you'd be elected forever. Can you imagine that? For some idealists, it's hard to imagine four out of 10 people not liking you. But if, if, if you want to be a leader in any kind of a way and stay sane, we have to realize you cannot please everybody. And this goes for any personality type. It's not just idealists. And I want to share one of the most helpful quotes I've ever heard when it comes to boundaries and being a people pleaser. It's not going to be on the screen, but you might want to write it down. I, I've, I've used this so many times. When you, when you feel like you have to make somebody happy, maybe it's a conflict in your family, and there's this continual pressure to please somebody, just think of this quote. It's a prayer. God, give me a softer heart and thicker skin. Isn't that amazing? God, give me a softer heart 
and thicker skin. And here's another way of saying it. God, help me become more loving of people and less sensitive to their criticism. Loving people doesn't mean you always have to do what they want you to do. Here's another way of saying it. God, help me to love people enough to not need their approval. You know, if you need somebody's approval, that's actually you taking something from them. You with me? If you, if you can love people enough to not need their approval. Here's another way of saying it, especially if you're in leadership. Help me to love people enough to lead them where they need to go, not just where they want to go. Some of you have already learned that in life and you learned it the hard way. But you're a leader and you lead, you lead people where they need to go, not just where they want to go. So if you love people and you're a leader and you want to stay sane, it's good to set boundaries with the prayer, God, give me a softer heart and thicker skin. By expression, I just meant, I think we already covered that really, to be honest about your needs before it's too late. Before you get too frustrated, be honest about those needs and people who love you will understand you. Okay, that's idealist relationships. Again, you can look at those websites and find a lot more detailed information that could absolutely revolutionize your relationships. So moving on to career. How does being an idealist affect career? You see idealists primarily in education and counseling, journalism, management, because they're great with people, medical health, public relations, arts, entertainment, pastors, a lot of pastors are idealists. Of course, there are idealists in other careers than these. It's just a guideline. If somebody is an idealist and they're looking for career advice, maybe this is a good place to start. Uh, because they're feelers, they're relational. Idealists are great in positions where they have to work with other people. Uh, and I, a job that wouldn't be great for an idealist is probably in a back office somewhere alone filing papers. An idealist would just, just would not be fulfilling for somebody who is an, int an intuitive feeler. They want to be around people, and they're great at building long-term relationships. If you want your clients to love you, put them in touch with an idealist, and they can build a long-term, warm, meaningful relationship with that person. Idealists are great managers and leaders because they have a positive attitude. And again, that's contagious and they can motivate over the long term and help people feel good. Idealists can just help put people in a good mood. So they're great to work with people. And then as, as intuitive people, they excel at big picture thinking. They won't appreciate cutthroat business practices or mechanical systems, but they will appreciate big picture thinking in the context of relationships. So here are some famous idealists and you can get an idea of who they are from their careers. Plato, the Buddha. Uh, you see, any, any major religious figure, inspirational, spiritual leader, probably an idealist. Uh, Albert Schweitzer, Karen Armstrong, Pope John Paul II, Abraham Maslow, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, Jane Goodall, Gandhi, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Nelson Mandela, what a list, Alexander Hamilton, Princess Diana, some of the most loved people in history, Maya Angelou, who just passed away a few days ago, her memorial service was yesterday, it was organized by another idealist, Oprah. So Oprah is on this list. Bono, the lead singer of U2. Margaret Mead, John Wooden, the famous coach. Richard Gere, no relation, wish he was. I wish, yeah, let me call Uncle Richard for some help. That'd be great. Charles Dickens, Sidney Poitier, George Orwell, Oliver Stone. Bible characters, there are many idealists in the Bible. If the Magnificat in Luke accurately reflects Mary's personality, Mary, the mother of Jesus, would probably be an idealist. That's a good person to have on your side. Most of the women, this is unfortunate, most of the women in the Old Testament are flat characters. We're not, it's just, it's because the culture was patriarchal. It's unfortunate. And we don't know enough about some of the women in the Old Testament to know exactly what their personalities would be. And the, the women who are prominent in the Old Testament are kind of the, the driven, society-changing ladies, but there are lots of uh, other men in the Old Testament who are idealists. In the Hebrew Bible, Joseph, Jeremiah, Elijah, Joseph was a man guided by dreams to become second in command in Egypt, if you remember that story from Genesis. Jeremiah and Elijah were fiery prophets. They were passionate people who spoke truth to power. Idealists will believe in something, and idealists are the prophets of the world because they're not afraid. They believe it so strongly and they have convictions. They're not afraid to, to speak truth, even if it hurts them. God bless them for that. Idealists will speak truth to power and make things better in society because they're passionate about their beliefs in right and wrong and justice. In the New Testament, 
I mean, check this out. The apostle Peter is probably an idealist. He's bold, he's passionate, he's enthusiastic. When Jesus walks on water, what does Peter do? Uh-oh, do we know? When Jesus walks on water, who's your pastor? Exactly, geez, this guy needs to teach you more Bible stories. When, when Jesus walks on water, what does Peter do? He, thank you, he jumps out of the boat. He just, I wanna come out there and Peter just jumps over the side with enthusiasm, with passion. He's not afraid to get involved and, and roll up his sleeves and do something about the situation. Tradition tells us that Peter was martyred for his faith, killed for his faith, like most of the disciples. And as the Romans prepared him, he was crucified. As the Romans prepared him for crucifixion, he requested to be crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to die like Jesus. That's a man of passion. That's somebody who has firm conviction and burns. He has a heart for something. Now get ready for this. We're talking about Bible characters. Everybody ready? You prepare, holding on to your seat. Uh, we're talking about Bible characters who are idealists. I've been reading the gospels for a long time. I've been studying the teaching of Jesus. And I'm just gonna go ahead and lay it out there. I don't have any doubt that Jesus was an idealist. The idealists are like, we win. We have the Jesus personality. We have Jesus and Mary. Booyah, we're the best personality ever. Well, I, you know, looking at the teaching of Jesus, you have somebody who's a passionate preacher committed to justice and what is right and love, warm heart-to-heart -heart love between God and other people and seeing how we're all connected. The Sermon on the Mount is all about how we're all connected and we're less in control than we think we are. And we're, we're far more connected to other people than we think we are. And he's a healer. He goes around healing people and bringing wholeness into people's lives. That's an idealist. Now, some of us have a hard time imagining that Jesus was human enough that he could take a personality test and actually come out with a score. Isn't that a little odd to think about? And, and no, the Myers-Briggs is not the gospel. It's not God, it's just a tool. However, scripture teaches us and Christian theology teaches us that God was fully, or Jesus was fully God and fully human. In the early church, many people had a hard time with the idea of Jesus being divine. The earliest creeds in the first few hundred years of church history are all working out the relationship between God the Father and God the Son in the Trinity. They had a, they had a hard time figuring out Jesus' humanity. They had, they had an easy time accepting his humanity because they knew him and they walked with him and those stories were passed down. Now I found, especially in North America, a lot of Christians have a hard time with Jesus' humanity. They have Jesus, you know, the picture of Jesus is, you know, the maybe the, uh, the Catholic Jesus, and it's a beautiful, majestic portrait of Jesus in the rotunda and Jesus in judgment over the world. Some other Protestants have this idea of Jesus as almost like this magical friend who walks around with them. And, and it's just, they don't, they don't get an idea that Jesus is human. But the letter to the Hebrews, chapter four in the New Testament, says that Jesus is able to sympathize with us in all of our weaknesses because he was tempted in all points as we are. Think about that for a second that Jesus experienced every, the hardships you experience, the things you think you can't make, him through, the, make it through, the discouragements, the temptations. Jesus was tempted. It says without sin, but he was tempted. Think about all the temptations you faced, all the things you faced in life, maybe right now where you're just not sure that you can make it through. And it, it causes you to, to question your faith, causes you to question your own ability. Maybe it, you know, after this recession, marriages are still suffering relationships are still suffering because we've gone through such a difficult time. The scripture says that Jesus was tempted in all ways, just like you are. He was fully human and he's able to sympathize with you or empathize with you in whatever it is you're going through. If Jesus had taken a personality test, he would have scored as something. I think he was an idealist. There were certain foods Jesus liked and certain foods he didn't. He's like, all oh, those beans, you can keep those. No, thanks. Jesus had preferences. Jesus was human. Jesus can sympathize with all of us. Okay, career. Moving on to spiritual life. We'll park here for a few minutes. Today in the Christian calendar is the, the day of Pentecost. Marks the day 50 days after Easter when the Holy Spirit came to the church. We talked about the Trinity, Father, Son. The third member of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. In the Jewish faith, the day of Pentecost is part of the festival of weeks. In the Christian faith, it's uh, the commemoration of the Holy Spirit come up, coming upon the church. 
The Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, or just the Spirit. Now check this out, the Comforter or the Counselor. It's a good idealist word, the Counselor. And again, I quoted David Kiersey earlier saying that idealists are the most naturally spiritual of the types. When I meet somebody who just seems so open to the Spirit of God, into a deep spiritual connection with God and with other people. And they, and they think about that spiritual connection and how, how the spirit is working all over the world. I think oh, that, must, that must be an idealist. Idealists just have an easier time, I think, connecting with the Holy Spirit than some of us. But the Holy Spirit in, in scriptural teaching is your connection with God. Every experience you've ever had with God is actually an experience with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is... God, the Holy Spirit works in our lives. How you are transformed by the renewing of your mind is the Holy Spirit helps you to renew your mind, helps you to grow closer to Jesus, reminds you of the teaching of Jesus, can check you at times. Maybe you've had this experience. You were gonna say something or react a certain way. Somebody said something you didn't like. And you were, you were tempted to respond in a certain way that definitely would not be loving your neighbors yourself. And you just had this check in your gut. That's not really a Jesus way of responding. Perhaps that's the Holy Spirit. Trotting you, moving you, to, you know, reminding you, ah, that's not what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself. It would be a great achievement for all of us, regardless of our personality. And I'm, I'm preaching to myself here probably more than I am to you. I'll let you in on that secret. It would be a great achievement if we could all ask a question like, how could I be more sensitive to God's spirit? Is that a great question? As I go throughout my life and my relationships or at work, my marriage and my friendships and my church family, how can I be more sensitive to God's spirit in this moment? And if I, if I find myself getting ready to react in some way that is not really loving God or loving my neighbor as myself, if, if I could be so sensitive that I can just kind of have this gut check. You know, I think we, we believe that God's spirit is involved in our lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, is in us and, and connected to us. And to be sensitive to the Spirit of God in that heated marriage argument. Oh, I'm preaching to myself right now. In that heated marriage argument. Uh, when somebody complains and, and, or somebody isn't living up to our expectations and we could be disappointed or disillusioned. What if we have this gut check and we're in touch with the Spirit enough to, oh, that's not, that reaction would not be loving like Jesus loves. And then I could say, you know what? I'm gonna make the choice that I'm gonna to respond to this person the way that Jesus would. I, I wanna love this person as I love myself. Back when we talk about uh, the different denominations in the Family Tree series, we talk about Methodism. And this, uh, the leader, the founder of Methodism named John Wesley. Remember that quote? He said, loving your neighbor is hungering after the happiness of other people to be hungry for their happiness. Our default mode is just to be concerned with what affects us. And am I mad right now because I feel slighted? That's just our MO. That's, that's the default factory setting for us. But if we're connected with the spirit of God who could gut check us and say, oh, that's not, that's not what Jesus would do. That's not how I'm leading you to act right now. We can make an adjustment on the fly. Call an audible and react in a different way that looks like loving our neighbor as ourselves. Idealists possibly are the best suited for that spiritual connection just because of their personality makeup. But that's something all of us to do. Here's a bit of guidance for idealists who want a deeper connection with God and other people and maybe avoid some pitfalls that can come from this amazing personality type. You wanna create a habit. If you're an idealist, you wanna create a habit in your spiritual life that fuels your fire. Creating habits in your life of maybe being around people who have a different perspective than you, or maybe reading a book a month, some, maybe some kind of spiritual guidance book, spiritual disciplines book, could speak to your soul and give you, and give you energy and prevent burnout in your life and, and, and give you a, a way of living and serving and interacting with other people that is sustainable. Again, remember, idealists will enter into the pain of other people. It's an amazing quality. And will will take on that pain. Their helpers will walk with people. 
They'll do great things in the world. And sometimes idealists burn so brightly that they can burn out. It's common for an idealist to, to always kind of be on the edge of burnout because they do so much. There's many great things in the world, but they give so much and they need to be refueled. Now, here's why it needs to be a habit of refueling yourself. Here's why it needs to be like, I read a book a month on spiritual disciplines. It's just what I do. We're going to talk about what that means here in a second. Or I talk to these people. I have this counselor I talk to here. Or this mentor on this date, I talk to this person here. Why is it important to make it a habit? And you don't have to be an idealist to understand this. Because if you wait until you're discouraged, it's too late. Sometimes when you're, when you're involved hardcore in the messiness of life, it can be an emotional roller coaster. And if you wait until you're heading down, it's too late. What you can do is by developing a habit, you can minimize the, the downward movements and, and just create more stability. And you can create a, a habit in your life where what, however you give and you're so involved and, and warmly in the lives of other people, it can be more sustainable for you. It could be something that could be long lasting. You'd have the marathon view and not just, not just burnout. I want to suggest some books to you. They're not on the screen, but you might want to write these down. These are some classics. Spiritual discipline books are about prayer, journaling, solitude, retreating, boundaries, this kind of thing. So here's some titles you might want to write down. The first is Celebration of Discipline. Discipline's a dirty word to a lot of people, but they, it can certainly minimize the downtime. Celebration of Discipline. I hope, I hope everybody will actually write those down. Celebration of Discipline. Another one is called The Divine Conspiracy. The Divine Conspiracy. Here are a couple of author names that could help you. Thomas Merton, M-E-R-T-O-N, Thomas Merton. And then a few months ago, I, uh, I quoted a Henry Nouwen book that people still remind me of from time to time. Henry Nouwen, last name, N-O-U-W-E-N. Anything, if you see Nouwen on it, read it. It's just a good idea. And, and if you have a, a habit in your life of refueling yourself, you're much less likely to burn out. Here's, here's why it's even more important. More than any other personality type, Idealists are prone to what spiritual writers have called the dark night of the soul. And the dark night of the soul is a poetic way of describing a sense of abandonment or distance from God and distance from other people. Could be linked with depression, but it's just this experience. And I have idealist friends who have experienced this. Maybe some of you have. It's this feeling of distance or abandonment, even in their spiritual lives. Have you heard about Mother Teresa's diary? Uh, Mother Teresa passed away in 1997. Of course, she was a model of love and sainthood. In Calcutta, India, she cared for dying people. As people were dying, she would care for them, and her and her sisters would care for dying people. Her diary was released a few years later. It's called Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, The Private Writings of the Saint of Calcutta. And her diary shocked the world. It, it, her, her diary revealed a level of honesty and a struggle with this dark night of the soul that was shocking to the entire planet. Nobody expected the things that she wrote. For example, this went on for decades in her life. She wrote the Calcutta Archbishop at one point. This is Mother Teresa talking. There is such terrible darkness within me as if everything was dead. It has been like this more or less from the time I started the work, meaning her work in Calcutta. In my heart, there is no faith, no love, no trust. There is so much pain. Do you think this is somebody who's being a little hard on herself? First of all, as an idealist, but think, think about the pain involved here in the dark night of the soul. The pain of longing, the pain of not being wanted. I want God with all the powers of my soul and yet there between us, there is a terrible separation. This feel God is distant. God, where are you, God? What are you doing? I, th I thought you were working my life. Where are you? Have you ever felt that distance from God? Mother Teresa wrote, I don't pray any longer. I want to speak, yet nothing comes. I find no words to express the depths of darkness. My goodness. Now check this out. In spite of it all, I am his little one. I am God's little one. I love him. Eventually, she grew more used to this condition. She wrote, I do not know how deeper this trial will go, how much pain and suffering it will bring to me. This does not worry me anymore, she writes. I leave this to him as I leave everything else. And 
again, there, she wrote, there is so, such a deep loneliness in my heart that I cannot express it. And then, amazingly, in an amazing statement of dedication, I want it to be like this for as long as he wants it. it just blow you away. Mother Teresa, the honest thoughts of Mother Teresa, a supreme idealist. Have you ever felt distant from God? Now, far be it from me to think that I could ever give Mother Teresa advice, but when you read this, doesn't your heart go out to her? Somebody who did such amazing work, I, I would just wanna say, Mother Teresa, you are doing some of the hardest work on the planet. And if you're an idealist, maybe, maybe this is true of you, maybe not quite Mother Teresa, but idealists are involved in things that are tough work, helping other people. Mother Teresa, you're doing some of the hardest work on the planet. You're, you're into the guts of life. You're into the kind of daily situation. Your, your daily reality is what a lot of people on this planet deny. There are people in Gilbert who think Gilbert is representative of the world. They just, they just go around living life in denial, blindly in their own denial coma, wanting to be insulated from the problems of the real world. Mother Teresa, you're right in, you're right in the guts of life. You're doing it. You, I'm not surprised you're discouraged. It's, it's, I think it's normal for the amazing work that you're, be do, that you're doing. But Mother Teresa, God is there in that hard work. In the, in, the, in the experiences of life that many of us want to run away from because they're painful and we don't want to deal with it, that's where God is. Mother Teresa, God is not just that Mother Teresa, God's right there. God's in the dying person. God's in the slums. God's in the barrios. God's in the poverty. That's where God is. God's in Nicaragua where we're headed in a couple of months, the second poorest, or a couple of weeks, the second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. God is there. God is not in running from pain. God doesn't run from pain. That, that's our, again, factory setting. We tend to run from pain in marriage or in work conflict or whatever it is, financial stress. We want to run from it, medicate it somehow, run from it. And I'm not against medication. I'm talking about abusing things. And we, we just want to run from things. But God is there in the suffering. Mother Teresa, God is there and God is pleased with what you're doing. If you're an idealist and you're sometimes tempted to feel like Mother Teresa felt, would it help to have some kind of a habit that can, can fuel your tank so that you don't burn out. You give so much, you sacrifice so much. Would it help to have a, a habit that could, fool, that could fuel your tank? Okay, in closing, probably one of the most visible idealists on the planet is, is Bono. We read his name in the list already. And, and Bono is probably in the top five, in my opinion, people alive right now on planet Earth who have done the most good for this planet. Bono led the cause to have wealthy nations forgive the debt of poorer nations, of people who don't live in places like Chandler and Gilbert. Bono spoke truth to power, to presidents, in a time when the religious right in America, who carry their big black Bibles to church and talk about the love of Jesus, in a time when they were just judging people in Africa for having AIDS and looking down on them, Bono woke up the church in America and said, why don't you actually love the way Jesus does instead of talking about loving the way Jesus does? Bono stroke, spoke truth to power. He's helped millions and millions of people. And he's a very wealthy man. And you know, being a celebrity, he gets a lot of attention. And, and we are kind of a culture where we, we build people up so we can knock them down. And so it's kind, of, it's kind of in vogue right now to trash Bono or U2 or whatever. But he, he's a very wealthy man who could have just laid by the pool and, and paid somebody to fan him every day of his life. And instead, he spent time with the poorest of the poor. What an amazing Jesus-like display of loving your neighbor as yourself. I wanted to close with about a two and a half minute interview on Irish TV. And Bono was interviewed about his relationship with God. And I want you to listen to his conviction and his passion and his ability to articulate how he sees Jesus and what that means for his life. Let's check out this two minute interview with Bono. Is that surprising to anybody? How plain, how clear? Uh, this is a guy who knows what he believes. He is an idealist. That drives him. I wish there were more Bonos in the world. I, I wish there were more people like him crusading to do what is right. And now I want to I wrap it up in kind of, an, kind of an odd way, but just something very sincere and uh, 
just kind of want to be open with you. If you are an idealist, and I don't, I don't necessarily know what percentage of this congregation is or whatever, if you are an idealist, I want to make a personal appeal to you. I'm asking you, if you are an idealist and you are not involved in this congregation, if you kind of come on Sundays, but you haven't really plugged in, I'm making a personal appeal to you. I'm sincerely asking you, will you get more involved? Because we need you. I know it's kind of awkward, isn't it? But we need you. The reason for that is we are a new church with big dreams. And I believe in a big God. And we as a nation have big problems. Did you follow the news this week? The uh, Yet another mass shooting in, in Washington at Seattle. You know what I'm talking about? Seattle Pacific University. There's a mass shooting in this country almost every week now. That's where we are as a nation. And people have you know, different debates about how to solve that and that kind of thing. We're not going to go there. But I think we are, a, we are a nation of people who has lost its heart. Anybody agree with me on that? You just look, you know, we have this widening gap between the rich and the poor. We, we ignore so much. Uh, we, we've let a lot of things slide for a long time. And we're a nation, I think, that's lost its heart. A lot of people have lost hope in the future. The recession crippled a lot of people. Not only that, I think it cut into getting all deep here, the psyche of America that was in, in materialism, frankly, in this false sense of security. And it just cut us all down to size. And I don't, a lot of us don't know where to go from here. And, and we're looking for something. Our country is looking for something. Answers. Because we've kind of, we've kind of lost our heart. As a church... I am, I am crazy enough to believe that churches like this can actually do something about that. If I, am, if I am totally alone in that, I'm cool with that. I don't think I'm alone with it. But I'm crazy enough to believe that churches like this can address that. Because this entire time, lots of religious people have been in, have been in bed with politicians so much that religion is tied up with partisan politics and people don't even trust pastors anymore or spiritual leaders. The people who maybe could help America to get in touch with its heart again. Is this making sense at all? It makes sense in my mind. I don't know, maybe I'm different, but I believe that God has dreams for this church and that God has dreams for churches like us. And, and we need passionate, spiritual, enthusiastic committed people who, who will burn with passion and help us to essentially ignite a movement. There, I just said the word. Ignite a movement of like-minded people. I'm in some conversations behind the scenes that are pretty cool with some pastors I know around the country. The, the time's gonna come when we're gonna be able to start new churches in some city across the United States using this church as the prototype. That time's good. Oh, Ryan, you're dream. Oh, you dreamer. <clears throat> this church didn't exist two years ago, right? You're sitting here because somebody had a dream. Somebody had an idea. And if we as a group of people can have a dream and an idea, oh, God's a big God. And God can accomplish something through those people that can only be accomplished if they believe and they're willing to do it. Idealists, we need you to be a part of that team. If you're not involved, please, please connect please. We love you and you're a valued part of this congregation.